So Martin Rosson, who's who is with uh, Rolls Royce in the UK, is going to talk about the development of high strength steels for gas turbine applications. I think we had a bit of foreshadowing from Steve on that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Harry, um, I guess we started working together must be around 20 years ago. So um, at that time, we had the materials and mechanical structural advisory board in Rolls Royce, which uh, we've carried on until very recently. And, and what that board does is it's uh, a group of eminent academics um, from, from around the world, really. Um, and they advise the, the company on, on sort of uh, difficult issues. And this could be for the development of new materials, for example, or it could be a, a particularly difficult uh, component um, in service. Um, and it's made up of probably about, um, I'm trying to think now, probably about 10, 10 academics. And uh, used to be chaired by the, the late John Knott. I'll be referred to in my presentation. So, um, so Harry was on that MSAB, and um, yeah, you made some very good contributions. And and on behalf of Rolls Royce, uh, Harry, I'll say thank you for that. Um, and I think at the time I was probably just about introduced uh, a high strength chrome bonds and adium steel into the into uh, one of our shaft applications. And uh, I, I cheekily called it Super CMV, uh, um, which is the name of stuck actually within Rolls Royce. And uh, when, I, when I mentioned the name at the MSAB, uh, Harry got quite excited because obviously very keen on Super Bainite, as it became known. So we, we, we used the word Super to apply to Bainite, and we had the, uh, the term Super Bainite. And, but that's a different story. I'm not, I'm not going to tell that story today. That was. Uh, that was, yeah, must be at least 20 years ago. And it was for an application that unfortunately was, was cancelled after a while. But um, it introduced some, some great new talent into the company as well. We've got the NGD scheme at that time, which was bringing, uh, allowing people to do a PhD with a, a bit of an engineering theme to it. And uh, one of those people was Paul Hill, who I, again, I'll mention in my talk. Uh, Paul did a, uh, a lot of work on Super Day Night at the time. So, um, so yeah, so that's that's how I remember Harry and we and we started then that following the Super Day Night program, we we then worked on something called a, which we sort of call the novel Mar aging steel. And I'm going to tell a little bit of story about where how we got to that stage. So, give me, it's not going to be a particularly strong academic presentation. It's going to be more of a, a story about uh, how we've developed shaft materials over the years and, and that sort of relationship with Harry, which have carried on until very recently, really, and, and not just on shaft materials, on, on other applications as well, which, um, yeah, that's, again, another story for another time. So what am I going to cover? So I'm going to talk a little, start off with the, um, the chrome olive and adium steel which are, are used on mainline shafts and, and in fact go back to the 1950s I would say, if not slightly before. And um, we have used different strength levels over the years, uh, but we, in order to, to sort of, uh, from the trends engine, in order to deal with the, the high torque that was required for that application, we needed to push the strength even further than we had done previously. So that, uh, so I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit, talk about how we, we got there. And then going forward on, on sort of uh, later Trent engines, we needed to, to actually increase the um, strength even further to deal with even higher torques. And, and that's the point at which we started looking at also high strength steels. And, and I'll talk about that. But the, one of the problems with ultra high strength steels is that the temperature application, oh sorry, the temperature capability is not that great. So that leads you on to finding alternative solutions. And I'll talk about the how we use the inertia welding to solve that problem. Um, so it, it, it sort of made sense really that you know, within the company, there was a desire to move away from welded shafts and, and have a single shaft solution. 
but that that required a, an ultra high strength steel which had some temperature capability and that's where the novel mileage steel comes in and and how it's solution itself of fuel i'll sort of finish off the talk so the for those of you not familiar with uh, the gas turbine engine um, so left to right so the air comes in on the left hand side of that diagram um, and it goes out on the right hand side um, we have a, a core which is where the where you can see most of the components there forgive me i'm not used to uh, i don't know if you can see my cursor zooms a new one to me so i'm not sure how to bring out bring up on the cursor but um if you can see the arrow um, so most of the air goes down the core of the engine down here okay and an exits through here and then on large civil engines we also put a lot of air through the bypass here and that that improves the efficiency enormously because you're actually and you know this air this air that passes through the uh, the bypass isn't isn't combusted whereas the um, all the air that goes through the core is mixed with fuel and then combusted so i guess the the main reason why we wanted to show this diagram is that um, you can see that there's an awful lot of material that isn't steel in here these days you've got uh you've got quite a lot of titanium at the front end and more recently you've got composites here and you've got a, a lot of nickel based materials and if anything the the nickel based materials are probably creeping forward into the back end of the of the compressor here and even sort of with with temperatures growing even higher then we we need to actually move to even more exotic materials such as the ceramics matrix composites the cmc's as we call them so really um more and more high temperature application more lightweight such as composites uh, and the steels have become squeezed into the really the, the core of the engine so so the main applications for steels would be uh, mainline shafts which are the, uh, the the shafts that go through the center of the engine and also the bearings so there's there's numerous bearings in the center of the engine and also for gears and in in recent years of course um, for those who might follow rolls royce we've seen a resurgence of the use of steels for gears uh, so if you look at the on the ultra fan we're looking at a, a power gearbox so in that case the the actual um, speed of the turbine is now um, goes through so the turbine actually goes through the cow power gearbox to slow the fan down so that gives you a geared fan and that gives you even better efficiency than we have today so so yeah steels aren't they're certainly not gone away and the applications are becoming more and more niche and more important as well you could argue so that's a little bit about where the steels are used in the gas turbine So, starting off with the improved chrome olive vanadium steel, or as I say, we, we sort of call it Super CMV as a company. Which, so, again, the, we, as I said earlier, we, we've actually been using the material for many, many years. And the, the typical strength levels in the RB211 engine, which was prior to the trend, was something like UTS of 1240 megapascals to 1390 megapascals. And um, for the Trent engine wanted to increase that strength level. So it's easy enough to do metallurgically. All you need to do is reduce the tempering temperature. But um, if you reduce the tempering temperature, what that actually means is that you reduce the, uh, um, so if you reduce the tempering temperature, you increase the UTS. But of course, you now get a reduced toughness or reduced impact resistance so there's got to be some some measure some balance there as to how much you can afford to, to increase the uts and lose toughness um so what can you do well if you just if you're going to keep the composition the same and and remember industries like um gas turbine industry particularly when it's applied to um 
aero applications and safety critical applications. There's a lot of um, conservatism there within the engineering community. And understandably, because making big changes is, is, is a bold thing to do. Hence why we have the Material Structural Advisory Board, because if you do want to make a, a, a sort of bold change, then you, you, you want to sort of make sure you consult with the, the best in the world to make sure that your, your decisions are sound. So, but in a, on, a, on a basic point of view, if you're gonna actually sort of um, make a change, um, so like in a change in composition, it is a, it is a, a big program, a big program of work. So it's more conservative really to, to try and stay with uh, compositions that you know you've got experience with. Um, and yeah, as I say, it's, it's something you've got. It's not just the fact that we got the experience on the RV211 engine. If you went back to the, the Spay engine, we were all, as we'd already been using um, chrome olive and at, at a slightly higher strength level. So if you look at the diagram on the right, one of the things that we were very aware of sort of right from the early 80s was that not just for steels but for, for any of our materials the the cleaner you make the material then the, the the tougher the material is the more reliable it is if you like because it's not only the um, improving cleanliness doesn't just increase toughness but it also has a, an effect on fatigue properties as well and there's a, a sort of uh, a chart which was from a company used for special melted products in Sheffield, which uh, we uh, was quite an, uh, an important chart at the time we went to the, the super CMB material. And you can say that if I if I pick any particular level of um, uh, proof strength, then I can get an increased toughness as I improve the the cleanliness of the material. And so super CMV material is actually from a VIM ESR bar route. So for those of you who don't know, um, when we're talking about high strength steels to very clean melt routes, what that means is the vac vacuum induction melt, uh, followed by electroslug remelt or electroflux remelt, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on, and then a vacuum arc remelt. So by going to a, a much cleaner melt route, that means you can go to a higher strength level and, uh, and, and get, still get an acceptable level of, of toughness and, and impact properties. And so we reflected that in the, the specification for the material. Not only did we push the, the strength level up to, to a higher UTS, but in terms of the alloy control, we had a, a much lower level of acceptability in terms of the so-called tramp elements um, such as phosphorus and sulfur and, and also materials like tin antimony etc so those those elements wouldn't are known for if you've got uh, for embrittling the material um, you know things like temper embrittlement so if you if you temper at a, a lower temperature um, what can happen is the tramp elements can precipitate out on the grain boundaries and cause embrittlement. So by going to a higher UTS, you, you having to look a temperate and lower temperature, which is actually now starting to be in the regions where you're, you're worried about temper embrittlement. So in being able to have much lower levels of the tramp elements in the steel is very important. So yeah, inclusion control, good for fatigue properties, reducing residual elements, tramp elements, good for uh, reducing embrittlement. So that's uh, so that's that's really the story of Super CMP. So taking a, an existing chrome moly vanadium, 3% chrome, 0.5% moly, 0.2% vanadium, but around about 0.4% carbon steel, and then making it fit for purpose by controlling the, the melt route. And um, like any new material, we have to actually test it before we put it in the engine. And, and the, the, the drawing, or the, sorry, the picture on the bottom right there, is, it shows one of our turbine shafts undergoing uh, torsional testing. So it's pretty crude. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty sort of industrial the way we do that. But there again, the loads are, are very high. So you need, you need a sort of something pretty robust to actually apply the torsional loading. And, and that machine there, although it does look a bit in, in agricultural, I guess, by today's standards, 
um, there's, there's quite a level of sophistication there in that, that capability. What it will do is it will apply a, a major torque load. So a major torque load is similar or equivalent to a, a takeoff um, event. And it will then also apply a, a, an axial load. So that's again something that the shaft will see in the, in the engine. And then on top of that, it will apply a vibrational load by adding a fluctuational, fluctuating torsional load, as well as bending the shaft in a rotating bend. So all that is done on that one machine. So you've got uh, quite a complex load cycle there that applies to our, our turbine shaft. So, so that was Super CNV, and then, as I say, going on to, on to Trent engines, later Trent engines, we, we really then needed to, to push the strength up even further. So that's when we um, started the search for what a suitable ultra-high strength steer. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of those materials out there, um, but what would, what would be suitable uh, for, a, for a future um, aerospace turbine shaft? material. So this is just a selection of materials that were uh, available at the time we started to look at the uh, at this application. Um, and these are actual results. That's why there's um, a couple of values for, for each of the steel there. So these are actually results from testing that we did in Rolls-Royce. So you, you can see there's, um, there's the Ferry MS-53 uh, and all that material. Um, which is, um, sorry, that's not all that, sorry. That's a Quest Tech material, the Ferry MS-53. Then you've got the CSS-42L, which is the, the all that material. Um, Carpenter Custom 465, Obar Deval MLX-17. Uh, and another all that material there. Uh, you've got uh, one of our uh, competitors there, GE 1014. So they, they'd actually developed their own ultra high strength steel and then you've got material M at 100, and then some of the, the lower strength materials, which had, had sort of previously been favoured for um, aerospace and, and gas turbine applications. So um, quite a range, but as you can see, a very, very high strength. And, and when you go to these very high strengths, as I've already mentioned, you're going to worry about um, toughness particularly. Um, you know, John Knopf was always very concerned about us developing our high strength materials because when you as you push the strength up you lose your you reduce toughness and therefore your critical floor size for for initiating a, um, a critical crack becomes smaller and more difficult to detect so again a whole a whole sort of science and engineering involved in in the idea of fraction mechanics and how important fraction mechanics is in the aerospace industry so it's uh, it's interesting to note, isn't it, that the uh, competitive shaft material there has got such a, a huge strength, uh, over 2,000 megapascals. So um, very very strong material. Um, and so and the, the, here is the all the fractal toughness values, and you can see that straight away they, there is a clear relationship there that you've got. The, if you look at the GE material, which has got that strength above 2,000 megapascals, you've got a toughness that is already down to uh, just above 50, 50 megapascal root meters. So clearly you are seeing that relationship there between strength and, and toughness. And you can sort of, if you plot those results on a graph, you, you can sort of see a trend line there. So on the on the y-axis there, I've got my fracture toughness, and on the x-axis, I've got an ultimate tensile strength. And and by and large, if you if you look at the majority of those materials, you can see that you've got that uh, pretty much a linear relationship between strength and toughness. And um, but there are some outliers. Um, not all materials sit on that line. Uh, some of them, some materials do manage to climb above that line, uh, for for reasons which we, we, we probably understand. Um, one of those the reasons is the introduction of cobalt into ultra high strength steels. So by um, all I can say about cobalt is it, it modifies the stacking fold energy of the steel 
and and that allows you to do sort of uh, interesting things in, in pushing the strength up uh, and actually maintaining uh, toughness. And one of the alloys that stands out on there is the, is the Air Net 100, um, which has still got a, a toughness of 120, even though it's got a, uh, a, an ultimate strength of, of 2,000 megapascals. So back in the 1990s, that was very attractive. The, the idea that you could maintain such a high level of toughness um, at these, these very high strength levels. Uh, so um, needless to say, when we look, started down selecting ultra high strength steels, uh, Air Net 100 was, was one of the, uh, the first materials to look at. And um, it was, <laughs> so at the time it was called Alloy X with, with Carpenter Technology. And uh, I worked with Carpenter to, um, to develop that material for, uh, for aerospace applications, for the shaft application in particular. Uh, the original development of the material was for um, undercarriage. So, and the big advantage of a high toughness on undercarriage is that, as, as I said before, your critical floor size is, is large because you've got a high value of toughness. Therefore, it's easier to detect. So when you're inspecting undercarriage on aircraft carrier based uh, fighter um, jets, and you're, you're inspecting, looking for any form of cracks or defects, uh, the bigger the, the crack or the bigger the defect, then the more likely you are to find it when you're doing the inspection. So that hence why the, the importance of crack detectment. It gives you that bigger window of safety to, to actually find critical flaws. Um, so yeah, so AirNet 100 was particularly did stand out of course, what we know now today is unfortunately um, putting cobalt into, into materials has a, a major cost impact. And uh, cobalt is an extremely expensive alloy these days. So Air Met 100, 14% 14, 14, yeah, 14 cobalt is, uh, is an expensive material. So, so what is the reason why we, we talk about ultra high strength steels and going to stronger and stronger materials is that generally speaking for, for many many years um, there's been accepted that there is this relationship between fatigue capability which is what we at the end of the day what we're really interested in on for the shaft uh, yeah the mainline shaft applications is actually how many cycles the shaft will actually do before we have to safely retire it from service. So the, the more cycles that we can do, um, the more cost effective it is as a, as a material solution. You know, clearly, if you put um, a component into a, an aero engine and it's only got 2000 flights, that is not cost effective because it means that you've got to bring that engine back into an overhaul base. You've got to disrupt the, um, you know, the actual um, service running of that product. Uh, it, it causes the customer all sorts of problems, logistics of getting the aircraft back into overhaul base and into servicing. So the, the higher the fatigue life you can get, then the better, the uh, yeah, the, the much better for the for the customer. So endurance limit, which or fatigue limit, depending on your alloy, is the is the point at which your fatigue curve sort of runs out, it stabilizes, and it is very much uh, related to the actual um, um, strength of the material. So the, the higher the strength of the material, then the, um, the higher the endurance limit. And you can see there's quite a good relationship between what we see as the calculated value and the actual measured value, and uh, according to those equations there. Uh, So, um, so there, simple. We will just keep increasing the strength of the material and we'll get longer and longer fatigue lines uh, at a higher stress, of course, because we need to up the stress as well. That's the, that's the tricky bit. We want to increase the stress so that we can get more torque through the shaft. And more torque through the shaft means we get better fuel efficiency. Um, 
and so we can put the strength up uh, we can get more uh, um, and we can sort of sorry we can put the strength of the material up we can get highest torque stress and we can also get longer lives as well we can keep, keep we'll certainly keep the same life that we had with the, the previous material um, it works up to a point and, and that's I guess what this graph shows again uh, by the Murakami is it's showing that as you put the, the strength up it works to a point and then at some point the you know the the fatigue limit just starts to drop off um and quite spectacular so you you straight to work so so you've got the the problem straight away that i've got I now put a 2000 megapascal material into service but i haven't got the same fatigue line and the reason why is because many of these high strength ultra high strength steels use precipitates which are not particularly good for fatigue and an example there is uh, uh, on the right, which is, uh, oh, I can't remember, it's probably maybe a titanium nitride, it could be titanium carbide, but that is essentially, it's a cuboidal um, precipitate, uh, not very good for fatigue. So um, nice, nice crack initiation type of inclusion there. So, uh, it's, so you need to do better. You need to, to actually have a steel that's got precipitates in there, which don't actually contribute to reduction in fatigue strength. So, AirMet 100 is, is not a perfect material, as I've said. Um, it's, it's got very low temperature capability, sort of 350 at the most, and, and we need above 400. So, after all that development, instead of having a huge forging in AirMet 100, as you see in the bottom image there, um, what you end up with is a, a shaft which is all super CMV up until the weld and then the front section is the AirMet 100 section. So just to illustrate that there you've got the you've got super CMV and then the AirMet 100 inertia welded together. So what that means is that you can use the, the AirMet 100 part of the shaft which is the, the front part uh, for your splines so your engagement splines a bit like gear teeth really so you put all the torque through those teeth, through those spline teeth, and and the stresses can rise quite uh, dramatically at the in the peak stress positions in that in that uh, spline. Um, you're talking sort of at well over 2,000 megapascal peak stress. Um, but then behind that spline, the, the shaft gets hotter and hotter. Um, so you need to re you need to go back to your chrome olive vanadium steel. Simple as that. You, you just can't use the AirMet 100 for the whole shaft. You need a you need a, a welded solution. So, in some ways, that's a good, I guess, because a 14% cobalt steel. You know, if we'd used it for the whole shaft, that would have been a, a very, very expensive shaft indeed. Um, but it, it does mean you've got this um, inertia welded uh, uh, shaft, which is logistically a more expensive thing to do than bringing two different forgings together having uh, an inertia welding capability, uh, et cetera. So yeah, not the idea. So so we went, so myself and uh, uh, a colleague who worked in transmissions design at the time, we went to see Harry. We went to talk to Harry and said, um, well, what can we do? What can we do to, to get away from having a, to, to do this inertia welded shaft? And um, I remember it to this day, um, Harry came up with the concept of a novel mar aging steel, and he used the term, um, yes, you need to avoid austenite reversion, um, which was never heard of before at the time, uh, but there we go. So that was, that was the, uh, the challenge. And we, um, we, um, and we took on a, a PhD, a new PhD student at the time, who, who is now with us in Rolls Royce, has been for quite a number of years, a guy called Andrew Barrow, who went away and put Harry's ideas into, into some alloy concepts. Um, so this is the first alloy concept. And um, interestingly, you might recognize that it's got nickel aluminium precipitate in there, which we've, we've, as Steve Oye has just talked about. And indeed, Steve Oye worked with us um, on this alloy uh when we were doing the sort of early development stages so we've got 
uh, a nickel aluminium, nickel aluminium precipitate or beta precipitate in there. And then the piece of resistance for the temperature capability is the larvae phase. So we put larvae phase in there as well. Now, yeah, it's not everyone's uh, choice, but it does give you that uh, potential temperature capability. Um, but it does, it does present quite a big challenge. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of uh, those lines on there, HD3 and HD4, uh, they're basically those um, STEM microscopy images there. So if you take, so you can see the larvae phase uh, quite clearly there, the, this, these quite large white particles, very bright in the left hand image. If you, if you take the material up to a higher temperature, a solution temperature, um, you can reduce the amount of larvae phase you're seeing, although you get these, if you like, larger particles now, which appear to be on some sort of boundary here. And, um, and I know Steve was, was instrumental in characterizing this sort of distribution of phases. So, so that was where we were. Um, well, and we worked with Swansea University as well on this. So, so we had another PhD at Swansea, Stephen McCadden, and I'll talk a little bit about the collaborative nature of this project for another bit. Um, so, but, <laughs> Uh, what did us what was saying about precipitates and or you know and, and what can be the, the downside of them? The um, the toughness. So the main problem with the alloy was the fracture toughness, and we were seeing, uh, although we saw some good values in in small scale melting, by the time we started to scale up, the fracture toughness was sort of in the thirties, so uh, not particularly good. Um, a bit of a concern really. So we had to do something. And the nature of the program was say it was very much a collaborative program with a, a number of universities. But um, I think there was uh, a few of us sat around a table um, and we, over a few, a course of a, probably a few months and, and discussed the, the results that we were seeing from mechanical testing and from transmission electron microscopy. And, and we, we, we sort of came up eventually with a composition, which is the, the bottom. So what you see here on the top two rows is the original Andrew Barrow composition, uh, which we uh, jokingly sometimes call Barrowloy, and which is the, again, relates to the, the, the transmission electron microscopy issue, images you see below. But is Martin, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we, yeah. We're kind of on the cusp of Q and A time, but continue if you. Uh, if oh, you apologies. Are sorry, I thought right. uh, I was trying to. <laughs> I'll move. It's fine. I'll try to move a little. So sorry, I maybe I was obviously in my own little world there. Um. So yeah. So we were, came up with a composition nine nine two two, um, which I thought was quite catchy, but unfortunately in, within Rolls Royce itself, the the preference was to stick with the internal name, which was F one A. So the other challenge that we faced with the material was the um, when we went to a larger scale, and this is even with the 9922 material, is the, the grain size. So we had such a very coarse grain size on this material, um, a columnar nature along the actual forging direction. Um, and again, that contributed to low fracture toughness. So, so the, again, this is the work we did with Swansea University. Uh, with Tom Sim looking at the trying to um, image the the far off smart grain size. Um, so with nine nine two two, when we actually did the fatigue testing, um, what we found was we got very good results. So we were starting to get make headway in terms of improving the material. So the composition definitely gave us some advantages. And there you can see the uh, this is a more of a high cycle fatigue testing and plain cycle, plain fatigue testing. You've got the um, the F one E in red there, and the M at one hundred in the in the sort of turquoisey blue color. So uh, definitely, um, I'm still seeing an improvement in the material there. And just we did work with Oxford, so Oxford was it were part of the team as well, and we looked at the um, both the uh, the beta phase and also the uh, we looked at the larvae phase and did quite a lot of characterization work there to try and understand where the larvae phase 
was uh, was in within themselves for sure. And, and it, I think it's fair to say that we were we were still seeing relatively low fracture toughness, um, certainly um, below the 50 value, which was our target. And one of the things we was to do with where we were finding the larvae space, the larvae space was still presenting us with some challenges there in terms of where it was sitting on the uh, on the sort of some of the last boundaries there. And ultimately, it was a heat treatment um, that we, we used, which distributed, um, which improved the larvae space distribution and, uh, and increased the fracture toughness to, to give us a good target value of, of, of over 50. So all in all, quite a, quite a success story there. And, and I, as I said, I talked before, Paul Hill was involved very much with the, with the whole development of the, this more aging steel. And, and, and as a fitting sort of finale, Paul actually identified a, a novel heat treatment approach, which is a cyclic heat treatment um, to actually give the improvement in toughness that we needed. And, and also actually improve the creep resistance of the material, which was good. And um, ultimately what we did, we, we did a, a component feature test on a small scale spline. So that's a shaft spline you can see there from Nottingham University. So again, part of the collaboration working with Nottingham University to do the, the component testing. And you can see that how much better the, um, the F1E material is compared with the, um, the Super CMV uh, when it comes to the actual component testing of a spline. So quite, in, well, quite impressive result there. Um, so just to summarize then, uh, hopefully I'm pulling, I'm, I'm possibly looking at the watch on very many apologies. Um, so just to summarize, uh, so we, with Harry's input, we, we, we came up with the, the novel approach to a more aging steel. Initially, with uh, starting off with, uh, with Andrew Barrow, uh, PhD. We had an optimization of the competition through working with a whole team of people from Cambridge, from Swansea, Birmingham, Nottingham, and Oxford Universities, which are the majority of which are part of the Rolls Royce UTC. Uh, and uh, of course, then with along with the specialists like Paul within Rolls Royce. And the, the final scaling up of, to, to the sort of size of shafts that you're seeing there, the single piece solution, you know, no inertia welding there. The final scaling up was uh, funded through an ATI silhouette project. And then ultimately we did some further manufacturing trials with a, an ATI Samulet project. And the, we, we got, we've got the material to above a technology readiness level four. Um, and to be honest, there's, there's probably not a lot more work that would be needed to get it to a technical re technology readiness level six, which is at the point where you can you can actually start putting it into service. So um, all in all, in terms of the, the material capability, uh, a real success story. So um, thank you, Harry, for that for that journey, and and certainly do wish you all the best in retirement. And um, if there's any opportunities to still work together or at least uh, discuss possibilities then that'd be great and uh, thank you very much and uh, yeah if, there, if there's time for any questions then uh, I'll, uh, I'll have to take them. Thanks very much Martin yeah I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions if there are any questions so please right. um, raise your hands or just stick yeah. them in the chat. So Neil um, I, I, I'd like a question so Martin thank you for that uh, splendid lecture actually. Okay. Um, Last time I talked with Paul Hill, uh -huh. uh, he actually put the shaft into an engine on the ground. Yes. Right. So, Paul, what has happened at that? Do you know? Uh, well, it's probably the short answer is COVID, Harry. Ah. <laughs> okay. So, okay. so we, what? Yeah, he, he did quite right. He had put it into a ground run demonstrator, but um, clearly, it is. so the great thing is, I mean, we have got a, we've got a. Obviously, we've patented the material with you, Harry. So mm. that's another great success of the material. Um, Martin, we've got a, a question through. Um, it's in the chat, but would the lean cobalt mar aging idea possibly work? So there is a lean uh, mar aging alloy, which was Questec, and it would certainly be a, a really good contender for uh, replacing Air Metal 100. 
I've, I've no doubt about that. You know, if I had, if we had the time and the funding, and uh, if there was a business case for it, then I would look to use the the Questnet, the low cobalt solution to replace AirMet 100. What I've not seen um, is any evidence of temperature capability. Um, we we do need temperature capability for for some of our shaft applications, and it's it's not it's modest, but um, you know any any change in properties with with um, uh, service exposure is a concern. So um, that from from what I've seen, I've not seen any evidence yet of, of thermal stability. 